Welcome to Drinking from the Firehose. I'm Roger Wilcox and I'm co-hosting this series with Murray McMillan, who you'll see shortly. This video is aimed at equipping managers to improve their team's performance. The focus of this video is creating a problem-solving culture. We're going to give you some practical tips how to do that. And at the end of the video, we'll leave you with an activation, enabling you to immediately put into practice what you've heard. So what's the goal? The goal is for leaders to create a problem solving culture within their team and to transform each team member into a skilled problem solver. Why is it important for leaders to create a problem solving culture? Well, one of the characteristics of great performing teams is that every member of the team are empowered to eliminate errors and continually make improvements. Excellent results come when everyone actively eliminates defects that erode value, reduce efficiency or create waste. In fact, teams without a problem-solving culture at the heart of them are typically 25% higher cost than world-class performers. When problems get ignored and not solved or not reported, then people start creating workarounds to get things done, and those lead to further inefficiencies. Now, skilled problem-solvers get to the root of the problem and eliminate the underlying cause, and this completely eliminates repeat failures, and that leads to huge improvements. Now, you may be wondering, who's this for? I'm office-based. Does it apply to me? Well, yeah, it does. I'm site-based. Does it apply to me? Yeah, it does. It's for everyone who wants to improve their team's performance. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Murray McMillan, who's co-hosting uh, this with me, and let him talk about how you assess your current performance. So over to you, Murray. All right. Thanks, Roger. So yeah, just actually adding a couple of things to you. I think absolutely this, this covers every industry, every sector. I don't think I've ever worked on a project that doesn't have uh, issues and problems and opportunities. Uh, and I guess that's the second part. We were talking about problem solving through a lot of this and people recognizing problems and defects. You know, you and I call them defects from some previous work we've done. But also look at them as opportunities. You know, if there is a defect or a problem where you're digging down into the root cause or something, it's an opportunity to improve. So there's a danger some people see these as bad things and therefore try to sweep them under the carpet. I'd be glass half full and say there are opportunities, get them out there, make them visible and go chase them. And that probably takes us into the current performance. So a few, a few checks just to sort of try and assess where you are at the moment and therefore what you can do to, to progress is, you know, are all of your team fully aware and, and comfortable with the various problem solving techniques? you know, things like five whys, three Cs, and, and various ones. Now, we'll actually cover these in a bit more detail a bit later in the session. But most of these techniques are very, very simple. I think the, the biggest thing I've come across over the years is people are just not comfortable doing them, especially if you're stood up in a group and you're at a whiteboard. But actually, they're, they're very, very simple. And I, I get my biggest uh, suggestion is just do as much of it as you can. Get comfortable with it. And then it almost becomes just a, a natural, automatic thing to do. So don't overthink it. Do a five Ys or a three Cs uh, and crack on and try and find some improvements. And maybe relating back to some of our previous videos, how visible are the problems? So again, my earlier point, don't, don't sweep them away, don't hide them, have them out there and visible. Organizations that are very good at this have you know, big charts up or tables or boards with all their the things that they're chasing. Uh, and again, like one of our previous ones, you don't necessarily need a list of 100, have five that you're working on right now or 10 and make sure you do them and then go find another 10. But I think the key thing would be keep it visible. So the, the challenge or the question is how visible is that with you just now? Another check is I guess with your sort of processes and procedures that you operate within the business, how many of them have workarounds? Because mm. that's usually a good clue to the fact that there's a defect or an issue or a problem in there that over the course of time, it's become custom and practice do it a different way uh, and you've now got a workaround. So again, that suggests there's an issue and therefore an opportunity to improve it uh, and make it better. And finally, on, on the current performance stuff, when you've got problems and, and defects like this, does it just naturally sort of uh, move to your, your uh, Six Sigma black belt or your team leader, uh, or does everybody get involved? Um, you know, if you've got a black belt, fantastic. If the team leader's good at this, fantastic. But again, you know, it's maybe more powerful uh, to have everybody involved. So again, just another good little check. Mm -hmm. uh, any other ones to add on that, Roger? 
No, I think think that's a good list. I think um, you know that that one about making sure that you really um, get it down into the team, so it's not left up to an expert or anybody else. But you 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 know you take ownership of that, and I, I guess that leads on to how to achieve the goal. So I think for me, the first thing you need to do is to train every member of your team to recognise problems and defects. So you're not going out to the expert, you're not going to the the Lean Six Sigma expert, but you've trained everybody on how to recognise problems and how to eliminate them. And you may think it's obvious what the problems are. However, all too often people are operating at a suboptimal level and they don't even know it. So one example, one team I know required every approval to have a wet signature, and that may be common in other places as well, but by the time you get a wet signature, that means that you've got to print out paperwork, you've got to find the person to sign the paperwork, you've got to scan the paperwork to keep an auditable trail. Now, interestingly enough, when coronavirus hit, they couldn't continue working that way. And what they started to do was to use the available technologies, and now they electronically sign the documentation. It's actually speeded up the processes, it's cut down on paperwork, it's also reduced the stationary costs. Now, in this case, the change was forced upon them by coronavirus. However, the fact was that they've been living that way inefficiently for years. So it's a good example of a defect that was in place in the system. So one of the things that a team leader needs to do is to train their teams how to recognize problems and defects and then to focus on eliminating them. I like to use the lean manufacturing framework to help people identify defects and waste. One of the really good things is um, uh, an acronym called TIM Wood, which stands for the seven wastes. So T is for transportation, there's inventory, motion, waiting, overproduction, over, overprocessing, and defects, which you'll hear Murray and I talk a lot about. Um, using this framework, you can start to look at what you do and identify the problem areas that are of value reduce efficiency or create waste. And one of the things I think is really helpful for a team leader is to enable people to start doing this using games. You can get into uh, very simple games, which can be done visually as well, but in virtually about how you can actually recognize the wastes, recognize these different defects. And then you can use that to start changing the language and start training your, your teams on how to recognize problems. So let me throw it over to Murray at this stage. Any other examples you'd want to add in before I come back on it? I think a few things stand there. I think you're absolutely right about helping people recognize what defects and problems are. I've been in so many places where you, know, you ask them what kind of defects and problems do you have? Oh, nothing, everything's fine here. And then you go for a walk around with them and they start pointing things out. And it's, I think it's almost just that being able to recognize that yes, that is a defect. I remember working on a manufacturing line a few years ago, a place that actually builds buses, and chatting to the guys. And initially, for them, it was just how they did things. You know, it was custom and practice. This is how we run the line. But when you started talking to them, there were so many ways to improve it. You know, parts could be in a different place or tools in a different place. And once they started thinking that these were problems and defects, we couldn't hold them back. They had so many ideas to improve it. So I think it's sometimes just an education that this is a defect or a problem something you can change uh, and again just something you said there Roger about empowering people I'd almost go further because I think sometimes people almost need permission to identify defects and do something about it I'd almost set it as an expectation you know I think it should almost be in your uh, your sort of objectives for the year uh, and a lot of world-class organizations it absolutely is you have to identify x number of, of defects and, and come up with some improvements so I'd almost have it as an expectation in my team uh, for people to identify things and improve and it should be a continuous ongoing uh, process so yeah back to you roger yeah thanks Murray. no i i agree i mean so, some things that team leaders can can apply very simply problem solving techniques as well so once you've got your teams actually identifying problems then how do you solve them so apply a, a problem solving technique some of the most common ones are three c's five y's mind mapping and Murray will talk about the five s's as well um, uh, three C's is one I really like. It's very simple. The three C's stand for concern, cause, and countermeasure. And so any team leader can use that. They identify, and any, the idea is to train up the, the, the team members. So the team members can identify what's the, con what's the concern, what's the defect, what's the issue, what's the problem. 
And then once that's documented, then they can say, well, what's the cause of that? You know, what's actually caused this problem to manifest? And then the next step is to say, what's the countermeasure? So how do we stop that from happening again? Sounds very simple, but it's very powerful. And in some places where I've worked, they've actually changed that. Um, and they, they've actually added a fourth C, which is containment. And so how they do that is if they've got an issue, they've identified it as a concern. They then identify what the cause is. So they've identified how, you know, what, what's causing the problem, what's the, uh, the, the thing that they need to fix. Now, they may not be able to put the fix in place immediately. So in that place, in that, ta in that case, they, uh, they identify what's the containment. So how are we going to work around, which may be the way they do it, or what can we put in place to eliminate the problem just for now? Um, how do we make it visible? And then in the, that gives them a bit of space to actually work on eliminating the, the, uh, um, the, the, the cause. So the countermeasure that they've identified, they're working on that. So you can either use the three Cs or the four, uh, or the four Cs. The other one I like to use a lot is, is actually mind mapping. You may not see this as a problem solving technique, but I think it's great and will uh, it really adds value when you combine it with other things like five whys, which I think Murray's gonna speak more about. Um, the mind mapping is a very simple technique. You're probably familiar with it. It's generating a bubble at the start, putting something down, uh, an issue or a problem, and then thinking, okay, what could be the issues? You know, what could be the causes of this failure? So for example, if you've got a, um, a problem, you can identify that in the middle. You can then say, well, what could the possible cause of that problem be? And then you start mapping that out. And then from that bubble, you start to say, well, what could the cause of that be? And you start to map those out and you can go different ways. So it enables a team to work together to actually brainstorm very powerfully. People can come up with different perceptions and put their blobs on this uh, mind map chart and actually start building up a bigger picture of what's causing the problem. Uh, so over to you, Murray, to talk about the uh, uh, the five Ys and, and the five S's, if you want to add in that as well. Yep, yep, I'll, I'll add some of them. I guess as part of on your, your mind map in there, Roger, I think that also encourages engagement with other people in the team. Because uh, I think sometimes it's easy to spot a defect or a problem, but you may not have the whole answer. That's fine. You know, almost certainly somebody else in your team or your organization does. So at least if you can kickstart it, and then you can bring other people in, uh, you know, if they're experts in this particular area, bring them in with their ideas. My only other thing on these solutions when you're trying to drive it forward, it doesn't always have to be the gold plated solution. You know, this is about making things better. So if you come up with a solution that makes it better, that's fantastic. That's a success. Yeah. If you can get the gold plated one, that's great. But sometimes aiming for that is almost setting yourself up for failure. So just set yourself up to make it better. And then you can you know, revisit, revisit, keep on doing that. Um, so yeah, coming back to five whys. Uh, for me, very, very simple technique. Uh, and it, it's one that I think people sometimes aren't very comfortable with. So it's, it's a really easy one. Scribble up on a, a chart, you know, a flip chart or a whiteboard or whatever with, with your colleagues and just keep on going. And the name sometimes is misleading. It's called five whys, but it could be three whys. If three gets you to the root cause, fantastic. If you need seven or eight, keep on going. Essentially, keep on going until you get to a root cause. And that's probably the biggest challenge is make sure it is the root cause. Uh, you know, so many times, you know, <clears throat> you work your way down through the five whys. A light has failed. Why did that happen? The fuse blew. Hey, the problem's the fuse. No, it's not. What caused the fuse to blow? The fuse was doing the correct thing. So just keep on going till you get to a proper root cause. Uh, and like I say, it's a simple, easy process. It just needs a lot of practice. And essentially, just keep asking why. Uh, and you can branch off. You can do all sorts of clever stuff. But a real basic five why also helps capture your thinking. So if you then take it to somebody else to try and get them to help you, at least they can see your train of thought, uh, how you got to the position you did. So yeah, I, I love five Ys, use it all the time. Five S's, uh, so you know, I think you mentioned this one already, Roger, is, is another really good technique. So I'm, I'm trying to remember them all in the proper order. So the first one is sort, you know, basically laying things out in the correct way, you know, tidying up a little bit. And I'll give some examples of these. I've got a few practical examples too. So you've got sort, you've got set in order. So again, is there an order you need certain things, in which case have them laid out in, in that way. And if it's a production line or an office or, or wherever. Shine is a fairly obvious one and it's often forgotten. It's basically tidy the place up, look after the stuff, 
you know, shine them, make, make them uh, ready for action and ready for use. So, because again, that can be a waste. If you're then having to clean something before you use it, you know, it's, it's a waste. Make sure it's set away and it is tidy and ready for use, as is your work area. Again, very important. Have a nice, clean uh, area that you can be proud of. Standardize is another good one. So again, if you've got multiple production lines or multiple office areas, all use the same approach if you can. If you found a good solution, try and standardize it across the way or across your team members is a very simple thing to do. I've seen so many examples over the year where one person has a great idea, makes a superb improvement and keeps it to themselves. You know, share it, standardize it across your team or your organization. And the final one's probably the most important, sustain. Find a way to make this sustainable. This is the new way of operating. Uh, it's not necessarily the final step. You may go back through this and keep on improving, improving. But yeah, trying to make it sustainable is key. A mm. couple of quick examples, Roger, because you know I like my stories. The, the sort, a really simple one I saw years ago was actually on a, a large chemical site. And the guys who were working out on the site had, a, had tools. They all had their own sort of, you know, wrenches and hammers and, and, and all sorts of stuff to use on the, on the site. But they actually had their own, they, they kept them to themselves. So the tool board, in, in the, the area was empty because every had their own little set of tools squirreled away, which meant if you came along and you didn't have tools, you had nothing to use. You had to go, you know, trying to find the guys and, and find the tools that you wanted a lot of time wasted. They also find they had fairly poor quality stuff. So their solution in working their way through this was to get one really good set of tools that was good quality, always back in the right place. So when you needed a, a 16 inch wrench, you knew where it was. And that's where you went. So sorting stuff out, really obvious that's the place you go. Set in order, a little example of that one was another place where they were using lifting equipment. <clears throat> so lifting straps and shackles and chains and all that sort of stuff. Typically it sat in the back of a van. When they went to where they were working, which in this case was a loading terminal, uh, just very slightly offshore on the, the Firth of Forth near Edinburgh, they would almost always forget something and then somebody had to go back in the boat to pick up what other piece they needed. Their solution was a cabinet on the loading terminal with all their lifting gear sat there. So not so much set in order, but it was set in the right place. It was the right gear in the right place, which was literally five minutes away from wherever they were working uh, on this little terminal. So really, really simple solutions, but practical and saves a lot of wasted time and effort. Yeah, I, I think that's good, Murray. I, in fact, I, I love, as I say, I love the five S's as well. Um, I've applied that in, um, in sites, in, in um, offshore, onshore sites. I've applied them in offices. Um, it's a really effective technique in an office. Uh, in fact, I've applied it with my kids too, <laughs> uh, in a simple way. So uh, one of the things that, that my kids know is that every toy goes in its place. And I'm sure many parents do that. And so one of the mantras of 5S is everything has a place and everything's in its place. And so we've, we've got um, cabinets where the kids will put their toys away and things like that. And they, they know everything has a place and everything's in its place. And so where, where, we, where there's, you know, you go into a room, there's lots of mess, they can easily tidy up. And so the same kind of logic applies. It's, that's a fun thing for the kids. But um, in a workplace, the key thing there is identifying where do you need things, what do you need to access easily, et cetera. Um, Coming back to the, uh, the five whys and the mind mapping and the other problem solving techniques, you'll see that all these start to, um, to work together. So for example, in the five S's that we just described there, you may actually find as part of the doing the five S's, you can do it in a very structured way. You can start off very rigorously going through these sort and then setting it in, in order and then shining. As part of, of you doing that, you may well identify some defects and you may find some problems. Um, what you can then do is use the, the, the different techniques, the three C's, the five Y's, et cetera, your mind mapping to actually start mapping out how do we solve these defects? How do we solve these problems? Um, the other aspect of, of the five S's alike is the shine aspect. And, um, you know, what, what, what we try to encourage people to do is to clean up an area. So, for example, it's very visible on a plant. If you go to a pump or something like that, 
um, you, you go and you get the people to actually clean it up. Now, part of the reason for that is when you're actually cleaning something up, you, you've, you're inspecting it. And so again, in your house, it's, it's great. You know, we, we will go around every so often um, and, and clean the windows, you know, and specifically look, okay, what, what are my wind, what's the condition of the windows? It's amazing. When you're actually cleaning something, you can really see what's the condition, you know, radiators and you start to see, okay, have we got any degradation at the bottom of the radiator, you know, for, through water coming through or something like that, or, you know, potential leaks. Um, and so it just works very well. Um, the problem solving techniques, what I also like to do is to um, really make things visible. So as Murray said earlier on, you know, how visible is, are your problems? How visible are your things you're working? You know, where are you on your five S's? And once you can get that visibility, then the next step is to start tracking completion so you can get into the performance management aspect of it. And rather than um, this being a negative thing, the problem solving, the defects and everything else should be seen to be a positive thing. So again, that's starting to create the culture, making things visible, starting to have dialogue about them, communicating the outlooks, uh, the outcomes of them. I think we, we touched upon there as well about the, the role of leadership, but I think for me, uh, one of the major roles of leaders is to actually create time for problem solving, create time for doing these things. And then the next step is allocating resources to do it. Um, it may be that you need money. So in the, in the examples uh, Murray was giving, you know, the, the getting additional tools or getting the, the high quality tools or things like that may require spending money. So one of the leaders role is as well to support the teams is to allocate the resources, make sure you've got some resources for that and to empower the people to tackle problems. So back over to Murray. Yeah, maybe just add a couple of things there, Roger. One was on the, the communicating the outcomes. Again, I think it's such an obvious thing to, to say, but it's easily forgotten. You know, people will identify a problem, they'll solve it, they'll put a, you know, an improvement in place, and then they'll move on to the next one. I think the communication is so, so important because sure as eggs are eggs, somebody else in the organization or the team will have had a similar issue. So when they can see an example from you, and I love photographs, you know, a, a simple before and after yeah. and a little paragraph explanation is, is pure gold. Because other people will see that, you know, whether you just send it out to them or stick it up in the canteen or however you share that, almost guaranteed somebody else will have something similar, if not exactly the same. Yeah. And then you've got more and more people getting involved. Uh, and you mentioned making the, the, the time and the funds available. I think one of the things that's good in there is it's not a free for all. So if you come up with an improvement, justify why you want to spend that money. So for the guys with the tools, if you want to go and spend a few hundred pounds on tools, why? Almost guaranteed the, your, the time that you're saving, uh, the waste, maybe there's some safety implications. There, there ought to be very good reasons to do it. If there aren't, maybe it's not the right improvement to be working on. But I would almost encourage people to uh, you know, justify why they need those funds. And hopefully not an awful lot of money, um, but you know, justify it, make it happen. And then, yeah, as a leader, you want to make that as easy as possible yeah. uh, to get them doing that. So, yeah, and then it's, you know, empowering people. And as I said earlier on, I would almost make an expectation. You know, there, there are lo there's no shortage of issues. Uh, there's an expectation as a team and as individuals that we identify these and, and do something about them. Yeah. And that's maybe then on to the, the sort of last part and how to achieve this. You know, we're describing some techniques here. There's plenty more online. There's some great books to read on this subject. It almost doesn't matter what technique you use, you know, go and try them, see what one you're most comfortable with, what's most effective. Uh, and if you get it wrong, no big deal. Try another technique uh, or, you know, go and talk to somebody that's used a few and get their take on it. And even you know, if you're maybe not great at five whys or mind mapping or any of that, probably somebody else in the team is quite comfortable with that. So get them involved. And I think that's a good point. It is a team activity. So the more you can involve people, so sometimes um, more complex problems, you need to bring in people from different departments, different teams that, that have different mindsets. Um, I think the other one from a leader's perspective as well is also knowing uh, when to use uh, more advanced techniques. So there's definitely more advanced techniques out there. RCFA, there's obviously Six Sigma, which many people will have heard about, there's FMEA and, and, and other things. And I think one of the skills of a leader is to know what your limitations are, what's the limitations of your teams, and if there's a, an intractable problem that you, you're not getting resolved, then 
definitely seek out the experts and focus specifically on that problem solving. But if you've applied some simple problem solving techniques beforehand, it'll have framed up the problem in a lot better way for the more advanced teams to come on to. So Murray, do you want to, any, anything else or do you want to go into observable behaviours? Maybe just one final bit on that, Roger, and it's just almost a word of caution. Uh, and I've learned this the hard way over the years. There are all these fantastic uh, approaches and methodologies for doing things. But just be careful the message you're sending out, especially at the start when you're rolling something like this out. And I've seen it done before where if you get somebody stood at a production line with a stopwatch and a clipboard, there's a danger you're sending out a really bad message here because some people will see this sort of thing and automatically think, they're trying to get rid of jobs or they're changing things, you know, or something bad's going to happen. And it's almost certainly the opposite that you're trying to do. So I think it's been really clear about the messaging you send out. Um, I, I wouldn't stand with a stopwatch and a clipboard anyway, but you want to try and do it in an engaging way. You want to make people understand why you're trying to do this and that it's a positive thing and it's good for everybody there. So just make sure it is widely seen as a positive uh, approach rather than something they should be worried about. So yeah, just, just a word of caution on that one. Um, for observable behaviours, I guess what sort of things you will see and hear and feel uh, when this is all running right. Uh, one we've mentioned a few times there, problems ought to be visible. These things shouldn't be getting hidden away. They should be up in boards, up in flip charts, getting talked about. That would be a really good sign. If you're starting to see that, I think that's fantastic. Uh, and I, again, you know, it's if you ever see on, on TV or online places, you know, Toyota factories and some of these real high performing places, They've got boards with a whole load of suggested improvements and things that they're working on. So it's a good thing. It's a positive thing if you see that. And likewise, if you start seeing people in huddles working away in a problem, that's really good as well. Uh, tougher in these times, they're maybe doing it remotely, doing it in Zoom, but also good. Uh, and I know from, from my own experience in the past, if they're coming to you as a leader and saying, hey, can we actually block out a little bit of time each week to work on this stuff? Fantastic. You know, that, that's a really, really good use of time. That, for me, is very productive time. If they're working, solving problems, that, that's a big success. Yeah. I think other things that you'll hear, uh, obviously, problems and issues being surfaced and discussed and, uh, you know, people talking about defects and waste. So looking at the language, you know, it's really important. You'll, you'll hear people using the language of waste. They'll, they'll be familiar with Tim Wood. They'll be familiar with 5Ss. They'll be using that language. So I think you can listen out for that as a leader. And, you know, ultimately you'll feel confident that your team own the problems. I think it's, um, it, it's, it's very good. We've seen it with many leaders that what they want to do is empower their teams, build, equip them with these skill sets and actually enable them to generate solutions. And that actually um, um, is tremendously supportive of the team leaders. But what actually comes is the people feel motivated. They're able to get after problems. They feel empowered to get after problems. Um, you know, they don't need to go to somebody else to fix them. But if you're supportive as a leader, it just enables the culture of problem solving to be embedded. And that leads to continuous improvement. Yeah, so, absolutely on that, Roger. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's a great place to be. Your role as a leader is not to identify everything and fix everything. Your, your role is to try and empower them and facilitate that process. Uh, and I guess also when, when things are successful and people in your team are identifying issues and identifying solutions, make sure they get the recognition for it. It's not about you looking good. It's about your team. Give them the recognition and, you know, they'll be off and running and they'll go chasing more. Everybody knows you're the leader and you're the one that's actually behind it. But, you know, make sure that you recognize the right people uh, and give them whatever uh, sort of reward and recognition that they're looking for. Yeah, that's just a really good point. Isn't it? I remember one place where both of us worked was um, we, we encouraged teams or team leaders to, to set some clear boundaries. And what they did there was they said, OK, you, you've got some problems and uh, let, let's take that problem that you've got. And the boundaries are that you've got to work, I think it was in about three week period. In three weeks, you've got to come back with a solution. Now, the maximum amount of money you can spend on solving that problem is 5,000 pounds. And so again, it was set in very clear expectations. Now, what typically teams wanted to do was spend thousands and thousands of pounds trying to solve something. And so that's where mind mapping and other techniques came in to say, well, let's break that problem down. Let's break it down from the 50,000 pound solution. Okay, what can you do with 5,000 uh, pounds? What would that actually lead to? And actually, once you've got that kind of culture embedded as well, you're breaking problems down, it was very powerful. It, 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 
you know, it really started then to lend itself to other teams saying, well, I can do that. I can, you know, fix something small within my control. And then that, you know, by the time you communicated the outcomes, it then led to other people thinking, well, I can do that. I've, you know, I can do this within a three week period. So I really like the team leaders to set clear boundaries. Yeah, and just on that, Roger, I mean, I remember that one well, but there's a danger that for some organizations, 5,000 pounds is an awful lot of money. Yeah. So I've done it in places where if you, you want to set a budget of 100 pounds, that's fine. I've actually worked with teams where I told them there was no budget. Uh, it wasn't entirely true, but it just helped get them focused down on small things. People are very creative. Uh, and if they, they will at some point come back and say, do you know what, we've got this fantastic idea and actually will cost 5,000. Well, if the benefits are there, I'm, I'm sure it will help. But yeah, it's all about just making sure they're, they're focused on sensible, practical solutions. Uh, and, and there's plenty of small issues. We don't have to solve uh, world hunger every time. It could be the small practical ones that cost very, very little. Uh, and as you and I know, Roger, thinking back to that program, I mean, sometimes it's just even things as simple as labeling, you know, putting labels and tags and, and things like that cost next to nothing, yeah. um, but can make a big, big difference. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, what we're trying to encourage people to do is identify ways of eliminating this waste, things that erode value. So the benefit of this is that you increase value, you increase efficiencies of the teams, and that's what we're aiming for. So what we'd like to do now is to leave you with a couple of activations. So the first activation I'd say is go out and ask each of your team members what problems they're actually trying to solve at the moment. And that's really interesting because the first thing is, how will your team receive that? If they say, oh, I've not got any problems, there's no issues here, then that immediately tells you that you've not got a problem solving culture in place. What you're really looking for is people to say, yeah, here are my problems that I'm working. I'm working on this one. This is the solution. This is how far advanced I've got. I'm bringing people in to help me with this one. Yeah. And so they should know exactly what the problems are they're working and where they are on them. The second one, as we, we've talked about in the previous videos, is the information board. So how visible are problems? Do you have the current problems visible on there? Are they owned by the team? Are people working them? When did you last review them to see where they got to? Are they stagnating or are they on track for completion? So those are the two activations I'd, I'd specifically ask you to go out and, and get after. So over to you, Murray. Okay, yeah, brilliant activations. I love that. And you have you got any problems? Everybody says no. <laughs> you do just talk about them uh yeah i guess the call to action is the same as we use almost every time is, is go and do it there's uh, there's no reason to to hold off and wait for these sort of things just go and do it Ch chat to your team talk to them uh, help them identify what are defects uh, and you know we've got plenty of examples if you want us to share some stuff just get in touch we've got loads of uh, material to help you with this and photographs and success stories so you know feel free to ask but i think the key thing is, is go and do it Go and do it. And as always, we'd love to hear how you get on. So if you want to share some photos of your successes or some details, that would be great. And likewise, and with almost everything else we've spoken about in this series, it's not going to be perfect every time. So if you come across some roadblocks or some barriers, get in touch because we've, we've not necessarily seen everything, but we've seen a fair bit of things, stuff over the years. So any issues, get in touch and uh, we'll see if we can help. But otherwise, go do it and good luck. <laughs>